I need to talk about this stuff that is going on. Um, can we get this video? How, how do you play this video? Yeah. Uh, I'm, I, I'm pr pressing play. It says that it's going, but it's not going. Well, I can talk about it without the video. So. Because Johnny just said that I'm going to light a guitar on fire and then start playing it. I'm, I'm not exactly that. But this was about how the world's on fire in general. How, how in Portland, uh, Oregon, how you have Spain, you have Venezuela, you have a bunch of stuff all over the world where people are literally burning the planet and they're fucking pissed. They don't really... Thank you, bro. Uh, so a lot of places what we've been accustomed to seeing that are fine are no longer that. You've seen the Paris riots, uh, Spain all over the place, and uh, of course then from here we move to Hong Kong. And like we live in a certain kind of bubble, and uh, Miami is not burning yet, but it might be soon if we don't fix a lot of the problems that we right now have. And that's pretty scary to me. Uh, I don't know about you guys, but. Um, so the pitchforks are coming, that's the Simpsons village and there's just a while ago in the Guardian article, um, British paper, um, sort of, they, they say that the new elites phony crusade to save the world without actually changing anything. They're saying that the whole blockchain space and most of these tech spaces from Facebook to whatever, they've actually promised us to deliver us the new world and, and help us along, but what they actually just did, really did is grab the power to themselves and help the establishment and the people, people all along the way got screwed. screwed. And there's a filmmaker that inspired me a lot, uh, maybe about 12 years ago, he made a film series called The Zeitgeist. His name is Peter Joseph and he comes very much from the communist or even socialist aspect of something, but as a critique of the monetary system, he showed me how the monetary system works. I, I um, through his films, and then I made my own version of the Finnish Zeitgeist film. But we just focused on the monetary system, the pro political corruption, and some of the ways that we might be able to uh, heal the system. And I paid a pretty heavy price for it personally, because Finland's not a place where you can rock the boat, per se, a lot. People like to keep it as, as tight as possible. So, But in this particular tweet over here, he says, perhaps the most disturbing culture creature of the pre-transition era was the businessman or business person, the entrepreneur. And this creature only the creature's only motivation was to create something you never needed before and convince you that you now do. And I really don't agree with this guy anymore. I think he's lost the plot a little bit. Uh, I think the entrepreneurs are the most important people in the space. And one of the tools how we can fix this whole money mess is coming from this space. But just to say what, what this whole thing is, that we really do need to deliver, because yeah, maybe here you have the climate change, you have AI, you have the Terminator, Terminator scenario, you have the age-old communism, capitalism thing, you have fake news, bipartisan politics, strip mining of the oceans, you have the coming economy crash, which is a lot of why some of the people here have kind of gotten that crypto is really important. We need to like get this whole Fed thing and printing money uh, to the ground uh, in in control and uh, addiction in all of its different kinds of forms. And here I, I'm, I live in London. I'm from Finland, and I keep seeing all the videos about the opioids and the, the crisis that is going on all over this country. I'm going like, fuck, man, we've got some real problems. So this is why I personally hate the scammers in the crypto space, like all of those fucking big connects. <laughs> You know, because, uh, you know, this need, this really does need to deliver. And we do know that the purchasing power of the dollar in the hundred years has gone from, I, I think it's only now something like three or four percent of what he buys. And it, it's fairly painful because I, I, I was only here like a year ago and now I went to the Publix and I, I bought some stuff and it wasn't that much and it was $75. And I'm like, Jesus Christ, like I, I came from Canada. And the Canadian dollar is meant to be less valuable, but it bought me more stuff with less Canadian just a week before coming over here. So that confused me a little bit. How can this be the case? But that's this is a part of the stuff why I assume many of us are here. And I also thought, I go to a lot of conferences. I go to AI, blockchain, whatever, IoT. I'm, I'm really into tech. I'm geeky that way. I, I freaking love it. Uh, so, but. In most panels, I keep hearing that people say that, oh, well, nine out of 10 businesses will fail. Uh, I'm going like, okay, uh, why is this? Why is it really? I allowed it to 
like sink into my belly as a feeling of what it means for you to start a business and how it influences you. If you fail, you go into debt, your family gets screwed. Like the, the whole avalanche of things of what happens to you if your business gets uh, go, goes under. What does it mean to you personally? And does it have to be this way? Yeah. I really started considering this. And now, this is half and half. This is now we're starting to get slowly into the positive side of things. I, I thought about now the AI awakening. You have the Elon Musk and the, uh, the Sam Harris point of view that it's going to take us over, but we might just get the first unbipartisan or unbiased news in the world. If you have an AI that will scan the whole of the landscape of all information and tell you point blank how it actually is, as opposed to all the human filters. So some of those things might start to help us along. And uh, let's see what happens with that. But now the final super unconference space, I'm, I'm sure there's a lot of blockchain uh, um, entrepreneurs and devs and people who are, you, you, mostly in the tech space, people tend to uh, identify as atheist or at least super agnostic or don't give a shit about religion and that kind of thing. But my talk presentation is about creativity. So I have to go into the story of creation and most of the, the ways of how we identify the limits and the breadth and the width of our um, universe, internal universe, you have to go into the story of creation. How did the universe start and how is that relevant? No matter how, from which tradition you come from, you need to at least be able to analyze what the internal limits of your universe are in order for you to become a creative person. Because what I'm really telling you here is that because we don't have any of these discussions anymore and it's become super anti uncool to talk about religion or spirituality in the West altogether, now we have the phenomenon like you have the sort of Messiah Satoshi and uh, then you have all the disciples who are around us and if you want like one disciple as opposed to another then you can't talk to the other people anymore because the, the, the crypto space, in fact, is quite religious and it's quite funny from that point of view because people don't no longer have that vast anchor of things. So everything gets polarized into small little tribes and then I, I understand the scam bullshit and everything and some people need to be thrown out and, and everything, but this is a grand perspective. And uh, what I'm here to suggest is that creativity through this guy, Sir Ken Wilber, I love to talk about this guy. He's, he's got these very, very popular TED Talks about how creativity is now as important uh, in education as literacy and we should treat it with the same status. And this is of course not what it is. We still run the whole of the global education system with the values of the Industrial Revolution. We're, we've gone to space, we've, we're, we're building Neuralink and going to Mars and, and basically we've got blockchain and AI and everything and we still treat people from kids with all of their creativity like they're line workers. And this is the biggest fucking travesty of our lifetime. And I think that why it really is uh, disturbing is that wealth is creation. Like the most prominent and successful entrepreneurs will know this well, that it's, wealth is not acquired, it's created. You need to create something. And in order for you to be creative, you need to um, attach yourself to the world of creation. Creation is everywhere. It is where we're born from and it's our birthright to be there. And unless if we embrace creativity now, most of your businesses are dead. The low-end uh, lawyers, the low-end coders, the low-end low -end, uh, doctors even are being obliterated because of AI already. Imagine what that's going to be in five years. Most of the businesses now started going back to the nine, will, nine out of ten will fail. It'll probably be worse unless if we embrace creativity. So, and if we do embrace creativity, that means that most of the problems that I started talking about, whether it's climate change, whether it's uh, our education, it needs to start teaching people into creativity as opposed to out of it, like um, Sir Ken Robinson says. So that's the big picture, why creativity matters is that if we do, we might be able to solve all of the other problems if we get an educated populace that raises in its consciousness level to a degree that they identify as creative people and they're then better problem solvers. Going to some easier stuff. <laughs> a little bit. Uh, this is Picasso's Guernica. It's a piece about the Second World War, the horrors that were upon us, and all of his life story being becoming one of the major uh, forces of creativity in the world and commenting upon what was happening and it's now at the UN office and a part of what really makes this art piece valuable is that he's a top artist 
and he commented upon something that was a major trauma and an evolution to the whole of the human, uh, human species at a, at a certain kind of time. With the, the Second World War trauma is still with us. So it depicts that, and I, I believe that's a real part of why that art piece is, is uh, very valuable, because in terms of creativity, I don't think it, that's actually one of his better ones. I think he actually tried to stretch himself a little too far, trying to make something quite vast. And from there, the fuckery continues with the art world to the point of that this is an artist called Sai Twombly, and this piece is called uh, Untitled, and all of his stuff is pretty much like this, and what this piece in particular uh, sold for $36 million. Uh, and I don't know about you guys, but that looks like a fucking ketchup accident to me. Uh, and so it, it's kind of like, a, a how, how I call it is like the Dante, <laughs> right? Uh, like my body just drew that. Because I'm, I made a comment upon the, the whole thing of like, we just want to, see the art world burn, so my body animated me and just posted that online, I thought it was funny. I, I call that insult art, because if you have a soul, if you have a being yes. about yourself and you know where art comes from, yeah. beauty transcendence, yeah. trying to imagine the future of humanity and, and, and where, you know, all of these things. This is the, the only thing that the establishment art world now knows how to do is to insult you to the degree that there's nothing left of you anymore and anyone sensible has left the space ages ago. So that's where we're at. They've printed it like the boulevard to the fucking ground and everyone still keeps kissing their ass and I think it's sickening and I think we should stop. And this is why I've jumped out of the whole of the art space entirely and I'm now full-blown crypto artist. I've fired my galleries and I'm here full time. Reflecting a little bit of what Johnny was saying earlier about NFTs and why digital art is, is important, uh, Christie's and Sotheby's, they actually have the real machine to verify their art. They, they know how to check that everything is legit and whatever, and they don't like to talk about the fact that, the, that out of their catalogs, up to 50% can be fakes. And you don't want to be that guy who buys a $60 million painting that was by this guy, who's a German, very, very charming man, who did a lot of the, the fuckery, <laughs> and his, his forgeries ended up in, in Christie's and sold for millions and millions, and he lived the lifestyle of, of kings, uh, up until when he got caught and then had to go to prison. But essentially, long and the short of it is, we all know the story of uh, Emperor's, Emperor's New Clothes, and the, the banana stuff is, well, you know. Um, so from physical to digital, the whole transition of what's going on here is that you have um, a whole, all of the, the physical art pieces have a lot of problems. I verify my pieces on the blockchain and it's, it's fine, but up until to the point of when someone might decide that they just want to sell the token to someone else and then the, they want to keep the, the physical art piece, there's no way to actually really control and what's going on with things like that. And you don't know whether they're forgeries or not and someone can upload their files. And so, so now for living artists who are starting to tokenize their pieces and you know they come from verified accounts from actual platforms that are being built or already functional that have a good reputation and you really want to do it right, uh, I think the physical uh, art pieces are actually going to become a lot less valuable. In a, it, it's in almost like our heads are going to spin in a way where digital art is going to surpass the physical stuff. And everything like Jerome's building, VR stuff, uh, all of those things that can be tokenized and made in, and monetized, the future of art is here. Because, and going back to Guernica, why I don't think it's Picasso's uh, best piece, even though I love him as an artist, he's a, he, it was massive. He was trying to stretch himself to make a whole world in a painting, and Picasso's uh, strength to me was his energy, the yeah. energy that he could put into a canvas. Yeah. And I think he stretched himself too far and the energy wasn't there. But if you create in VR, you can create on a small canvas and blow it up to 360 and the energy is there, but you're living inside of an art piece that might recognize you, that might start to communicate with you on some sort of a level and you can commission someone to create a world for you. And these are the, this is like Johnny was saying, it's, it's like the future is now and we're building them right here, right now. Uh, I'm a bit of a black sheep. I like to talk about money uh, in, a, in a way. I, I suppose that's not a black sheep in the blockchain space. Most artists like to talk about money here because finally we have a means to talk about money in a cool way. 
Um, but I don't really make luxury products. I make, I make investments. And they're physical items that increase your life experience, you know, or digital. They're super rare. They showcase historic events like Erniga. They're verified on the blockchain for authenticity. And I'm sorry to be known throughout the crypto community and beyond. And uh, this is one piece called Tropical. This was made for the North American Bitcoin Conference of 2018. And uh, this was such a joy because uh, I did a lot of research into Miami and art and blockchain and what, how it was relevant. And I made this sort of peacocky thing because crypto is a little peacocky. You have your Lambos, you have your moons and you, all of this kind of stuff. And it's a little like this. So I thought, okay, so it's a peacock that is merged with the palm tree, the tropical, I love the warmth, all of that kind of good stuff. You come here, you slice open the coconut and it leaks all the altcoins and itself into the skyline and you might get to enjoy the tropical fruit of it. That's all cutesy and nice, whatever. But I did a little bit more research and I watched some documentary films like The Cocaine Cowboys. And I'm an 80s kid, I watched my Miami Vices and whatever. And I started to understand that that famous skyline of Miami, uh, it wasn't here before cocaine. Most of it is banks. And most of them were built because of money laundering and, and cocaine. So I was like, okay, that's, that, that's something. That, that's a little punchy. That's why we have fucking Basel here, because it's all about money laundering. Right? It's the whole city was built on that, <laughs> that, that kind of stuff. So that, that, that was like, all right, so now, now you have Bitcoin raining into the whole of the infrastructure of the banking system, system and it's transforming it from the inside out. It'll take a while, but it will do it. So that's my comment on what's going on here in Miami altogether and with crypto and blockchain. Uh, so that was a fun piece to make. This one is another one that is here, it's called Red Eye. I'm just going to go through a couple of these very, very quickly. Red Eye is about my journey when I got into crypto. Uh, as someone who was in the money wars already 10 years ago, then I got into crypto two and a half years ago. A friend of mine introduced me to it properly and I couldn't sleep for four months. I, I literally just lost the ability to sleep because I was doing all the research on my internal hard drive went just absolutely ballistic and I, I couldn't like let it go. So, and I realized soon that this was the experience of many other people. They went through the rabbit hole and through some sort of a portal, they found themselves in a new kind of place. And it has consequences because some of your family didn't go on that journey, some of your friends didn't, whatever you might, like a lot of the social stuff around you uh, shifted because of that thing. So that's what this uh, art piece is about. It's the Alice Goes to Wonderland type of thing. I love it. Kenny. 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 Kenny was a fun one because I was listening to a podcast and I keep forgetting what that podcast was but the host said at the end yeah because they were talking about price and whatever the usual type of thing and the, the, the host said yeah Bitcoin's kind of like South Park's Kenny keeps dying and coming back to life I'm like that's amazing so I found the cutest puppy dog eyes on the internet and whatever and utilized that all together with Bitcoin and, and everyone recognizes it so this is how these are tools for mass adoption because many people don't understand anything about Bitcoin but they know Kenny so it leads to a serious conversation very soon because people go, oh, that's cute. And then I say, well, yeah, it's cute, but it's also the only system that we know in the digital realm that hasn't been hacked. So it helps people come back into this space. And that's really, I think, a part of what crypto art can do here. Another thing is that I've been collaborating with Lynn Ulbrick for a while. I just talked with Ross on the phone from Vegas, which was beyond mind blowing. Uh, and basically this piece is donating half to the cause constantly, so we keep doing that. That's about how we get a lot of power now as individuals. So therefore, we, we have a strong engine, but if you have a strong engine, you need to take responsibility for it. If no one's checking you and you're using Monero, don't be a dick still. Don't do bad stuff, even though some might not agree with what's going on with the governments and everything, but still have your moral compass with you as you gain this power. This is a very special art piece to me. It's called uh, Blood on the Podcast Floor. I was a guest at the Bad Crypto Podcast Show, and it ended up being something that a lot of these superstars started signing, like Andreas Antonopoulos and Vitalik Buterin, were giving it away to charity. So these are the old, uh, like it's my Dogecoin. It's a funny little art piece. It, as an art piece, it's, it's not much, but now it's gathered these uh, signatures from Rob Pierce to Charlie Schramm, Charles Hoskinson, whatever. And all of us, they've supported this cause that uh, we have set up a wallet for this charity that has been running for 40 years in Houston called Hawk. Uh, they've been fighting towards uh, getting women and kids out, out of the harm's way for sexual and physical uh, violence. Uh, and they now have a wallet. So once someone pays something over a million dollars, because million dollars is now, now the biggest amount paid about a crypto art piece, 
So we want to make it like 1,100,000 and once that gets sent to the charity, then I'll send this art piece over to them and then that's done. Because the, the whole idea is that all of us flawed and tribal and weird people did and we came together and did something good for the crypto space to help the real world as a use case that no one can deny. It. And that's that's a part of uh, something. So that's the Forever Rose, that's by Kevin Abosh, that's the most expensive thus far, that's Hawk, and uh, that's all of the rest of the stuff if you're interested in that. Uh, this is self validation. I suppose I'm very lucky to have this quote. Um, it's just that I'm not delusional in thinking that my art is valuable. Uh, one of the most profound um, influences for me uh, or originally was got a guy called Ken Wilber. He's an American philosopher and he runs uh, something called the Integral Institute. And it's essentially a map of the human evolution from political, spiritual and all these different kinds of uh, ways of how to put, put things together uh, holistically. So he looks at things from various angles and he's now widely recognized as one of the most brilliant minds alive today. And his uh, institute has an uh, art curator called Michael Swartz. Uh, he knows his shit, professor of history and philosophy of art. And he said that my art is amongst the most integrally advanced in the history of Western abstraction. Uh, no small claim, but actually backed up by the works themselves. So he put me in the category with the Picassos and the Dollies who I admire. And that was probably the biggest uh, sort of shift in my own consciousness, thinking and valuing what it is that I'm doing. And again, something that I don't find myself comfortable with the art establishment. I want to be here with you guys building the future of the world. Um, getting, to the, getting towards the end, um, Wall Street versus Crypto Street. Uh, I don't know a single artist who is pro Wall Street. I know a lot of artists who are... Actually, I don't know a single artist who is anti-Bitcoin. Not one. And I, I think that's going to change because soon there is going to be an artist who's going to smell an opportunity, who's going to say, oh, fuck Bitcoin. And then, you know, that's a monetary thing, very likely, as opposed to like a philosophy one. But right now, all the people who are running the conferences, running the companies, doing uh, mining, whatever it is that you guys are doing, support the artist because we're here from our soul wanting to do something with you guys. And uh, this is not going to be as good as this is now for ever. Uh, so the longer you support the people who are here who are doing creative stuff, they will be on your side because you can't buy this. This is the highest PR in the world. And allow artists to come and help the companies and everyone develop their own thing and they will communicate what the real thing about this space is to the wider world. So again, that's how creativity matters. Uh, this is something that is said to newbies uh, quite often if they do keynotes and they try and be interesting for a reason or another, so I try to lump it into the end. Because it's still a really interesting concept that, that there's more uh, people alive today than have ever died. I <laughs> thought, oh, Christ, that's a, lot of, that's a lot of folk, right? So, but we still, like paint is technology, it's just very old technology, we don't think of paint as technology, but we, most people still want the oil original as opposed to maybe a digital NFT or something that is a limited edition of something or, or, or whatever. So, uh, the way that I do these is um, limited edition because mine are digital originals and I haven't actually put them on the blockchain yet because the collectors aren't there because they're going to be quite expensive. And most people, if I say that this is a $50,000 digital NFT, uh, they're, they're simply, I'm just going to piss off the other artists trying to come across as an elitist and the, the, the actual people to buy them aren't there and the platforms might not uh, actually survive. So I'm, I'm sort of weighing my way into when I'm going to tokenize the 10 years of my previous work that are museum grade big digital originals. But the, the, the physical ones are here. The, like the couple ones the, of the Miami fuckery piece that's there for 1500 but most interestingly um, I found myself having a big problem trying to tell people because most of the time I'm not in a setting where you guys are so gracious as to give me this time to talk with you and tell you some stuff of what, how I think and why I think art is valuable so I found myself in these situations where I said to people oh this is what it is and eyes glazed over and people like oh I'm done uh, so Basically, I tied the art value to Bitcoin. So the bigger pieces that I have over there, they're now one Bitcoin. And they will be, if there's any left in 10 years of these first editions, they will still be commercially one Bitcoin. And all of a sudden, the conversation shifted because people started to understand that I've 
taken the pricing out of my hands, I've put, put it to the market, and if you do believe that Bitcoin is going to be $1 million soon, uh, in a few years or something like that, then that's what that can be. But if you now hold on to your Bitcoin, all you get is your $1 million back at the end. If you buy one of those, first one of three, and I go where I'm going right now with my career and the trajectory, you might be able to sell it for three Bitcoin. That's the beauty of art. If you really play this magic right, the amount of value that I've created over the last 10 years can surpass a lot of the different kinds of crypto investments that you've maybe made before. Some of you might say that's a pipe dream. Who knows? Uh, Artforcrypto.com.